Hello and welcome back to the rise and fall of the chill out room, a history of ambient house and ambient techno 89 to 96. Today I'll be looking solely at the British label Rising High. After making some small but significant impact to the UK ambient world with the release of the debut Irresistible Force album and a handful of licensed Namluke albums, Rising High made an unprecedented leap to being the most prolific British ambient label of the year in 1994, with 14 of the label's 16 album releases relevant to this series. It starts well with James Bernard's Atmospherics. The stark cover and hardly very original name don't bode well, but behind that is one of the era's classics. The album opens with Youth, 11 minutes of synth sequences and muttered vocal samples at once both classic spacey synth music and contemporary ambient. Bernard possesses an excellent ear for melody and the one on display here grabs you immediately. With its sinister loop voice sample, track 2, Complete Nonsense, quickly dispels any worries that Bernard will be too traditional here. A deeply unsettling track, it opens the listener up to the fact that this album may contain surprises. Phosphorus is ambient trance, a close cousin of the artist's Influx project. Mars Rain is pure texture, an abstract extended atmosphere evoking the bleak landscape of the title. Lost in it, on the other hand, goes for the jugular, a deeply emotional track that's hard to forget. Atmospherics really is space music for the 90s, not merely Berlin School with a couple more modern sounds like some releases on Recycle or Die, but a wonderful way to explore vast otherworldly spacescapes with new creative approaches and hints of classic sounds. A superb album with no weak tracks. Atmospherics wasn't Bernard's only album of the year, with his Influx project releasing Unique on the Rising High sub-label Sappho. Blending ambient techno, trance and acid, the record features the same superb melodic sense as Atmospherics, albeit with more in the way of rhythms. The ambient mix of Dreamscape is pure atmospheric style and the beats rarely hit hard, meaning despite some frequently very fast tempos and trancey synths, it will likely be appreciated by a lot of ambient fans. Occupying very similar territory to the Influx album is Air Liquid's Nephology, The New Religion. A remarkably botched release, the various versions of Nephology feature different running orders, different tracks entirely, and a huge number of typos and errors in the lining notes. Released as a limited 12-inch and 7-inch package on the German label Blue at the end of 93, this was followed in early 94 by a CD version containing an additional three tracks. Licensed for release on Rising High, the tracklist expanded to 12 on the CD and 14 on the double LP, almost twice the number of the blue vinyl release. The Rising High CD lists Aurora Wave and THX is on, even though they are only on the vinyl edition, and 6 tracks are misspelled on the sleeve. Four different spelling mistakes are present on the German CD. The album was given a reissue on Bandcamp in 2023, with new art and this time in the form of a 10 track version. Despite being called the restorated version, it doesn't feel remotely definitive. Oh right, yeah, the music. It's typical Air Liquid. Dark, gritty, quite paranoid, a mixture of acid and ambient. The title track is dark ambient with distorted, whispered vocals and analogue sweeps. If There Was No Gravity is 8 minutes of lightly drifting ambient techno. Kimnia is intense hypnotic darkness, the sound of a nightmare you're slowly realising you can't escape. The two-part Im Erl and Meyer Colburn is creepy drone. Cassiopeia is dusty electronic sound collage of sweeps, drones and crackling textures. The Clouds Have No Eyes is the sound of a panic attack. Between these are up to seven acid techno tracks, depending on the version you've got. The kind of warm, lo-fi saturation and harsh textures one might find on an early Aphex Twin EP being the sound of the day. It's very creative, very strange and very, very dark. Abandon all hope ye who enter here. In the UK, four of the album's tracks were released on the If There Was No Gravity single, both as a 12-inch and CD. This track was backed by two remixes of earlier pieces for a marble 10-inch release in Germany. Rising High also released four new tracks as the Space Brothers EP, although no ambient is to be found there. If all that weren't confusing enough, the band signed a contract with Smile in America, who, instead of looking at the pair's already boggling back catalogue and trying to find a way of streamlining it, decided to release a two CD set combining tracks from their earliest releases alongside new material. The increased difficulty of concentration features tracks from the albums Air Liquid and Nephology, and the Space Brothers and Mandragora EPs, plus tracks from the Robot Mars, Mercury and Air Liquid EPs, largely containing new material and released exclusively in the US market alongside this collection. Not to mention a scattering of otherwise unavailable material. 
This is a band who don't want to make it easy for anyone to hear all their material. That said, the album is actually a pretty damn good entry point for the band. A rare example of the mellow side, upbeat side format working. The first disc here is the closest to a straight up ambient techno album Air Liquid ever released. 70 minutes of their darker abstract experimentations and mellow melodic down tempo work, not regularly diverting into high speed acid every other track. It allows the listeners to sink into surreal landscape that the band create in their less hectic moments. For the purposes of this series, at least, the first disc of the increased difficulty of concentration is the go-to Air Liquid record. Resorting entirely to their dancier material, the second disc manages to be remarkably varied, showing off every side of the group in order to keep things varied and interesting, and it forms a consistent album in its own right, with everything from crunchy IDM to trancey acid to instrumental hip-hop. It's rare that a compilation is actually better than an artist's main albums, but given how much of a headfuck Air Liquid's discography is, the increased difficulty of concentration really is a great way to enjoy the music of their early years. I'm not sure what MLO stands for. I've had a bit of a search, but nothing comes up. The pairing of Low Records owner John Ty and Rising High employee Peter Smith, MLO, or an MLO production as the sleeve here credits, released a trilogy of albums in the mid-90s, but remain relatively obscure. IO, released on Rising High, is their most ambient. Indeed, it's the most traditionally ambient album on Rising High without much hint of house or techno influence at all. At times, it even feels closer to the rising ambient end of post-rock, with tracks like Open of Wimborne with its warm analogues and live bass sounding closer to groups like Lab Radford than the usual Rising High fare. An incredibly minimal, repetitive album, highlights include the spacious plucks of Fast Water and the subtle, deep pulses of Ghost. Although a world away from the likes of Spacetime Continuum and Biosphere, IO nevertheless has much to offer, a breath of fresh air and a moment to pause among the avalanche of 1994 releases. Evidencing the confidence Rising High had in its ambient material at the time, Wimborne was released as a 12-inch and a CD single, the latter pushing the format to its very limits with a 79-minute runtime. Which is fine, as this wasn't going to chart anyway. MLO themselves expand the simple original into a 17 minute ambient techno track with more than a touch of Underworld to it. With such a minimal track to start with, the guest remixes are given a lot of freedom, and as such it comes across like a various artists compilation. The Space Time Continuum and Wagon Christ remixes sound very much like one would expect from their own tracks. Exclusive to the CD edition is a 26 minute remix from the then 17 year old Daniel Pemberton, one time fax artist who has gone on to be a regular collaborator with FSOL and now works soundtracking Hollywood films. Also in 94, MLO released the descriptively named 1 hour 1 minute 1 second. Half a techno album, it also contains some beatless pieces, similar in sound to IO but less distinctive. Two Voyages does have some pleasingly spacey sequences, but the real highlight is the amusingly named album closer Birds and Flutes and Shit, a really rather lovely field recording drenched melodic acid piece that at least takes a jab at its ambient cliches with its title. Wagon Christ is not a name one would usually associate with ambient music, and Luke Viber admits that debut album Fat Lab Nightmare was very much driven by the style Rising High was having success with at the time. Vibert had been signed to Rising High after the popularity of his collaborative album with Jeremy Simmons on Reflex, and was still finding his way as a solo artist. Fat Lab Nightmare is the only album of his relevant to the series, but being honest, it's Vibert's 95 releases that made him an enduring name in electronic music. That said, his debut does have a lot to offer in its own right. The acoustic percussion of creepy opener Mahadelic feels like it should head into tribal ambient territory, but in some ways foreshadows future Wagon Christ sampling. Glass World is the real highlight here, 13 minutes of ringing ambience with one of the most fitting names imaginable. In a world of glass, this is what you hear when the wind blew. An incredible track. The title track's wonky melodies and clicky drums hark towards IDM, a style which Vibert has always operated on the outskirts of, and the piece's subtly developing repeated phrases make the track feel like a cousin of Ortecca. The Earhart trilogy at the centre of the album takes things even darker, opening with five minutes of chilling drones and doomy synth thuds before Vibert dives into artificial intelligence style IDM and then slow lolloping trip hop loops. The weird pitch shifted wordless vocal sample creates a real sense of unease throughout. Their stilted funk of closing pair, Panarock and Dances with Francis feels like Vibert's true self reaching out from his ambient techno straitjacket, although he still manages to throw in some atmospheric pads to keep it tied to the style. In what feels like an almost intentional public development of his sound, the approach of these closing tracks is built upon for the album supporting EP, Sunset Boulevard, in which Luke continues to use the sound palette he stuck to on Fat Lab Nightmare, but applies it to jazzy melodies, swing rhythms, lively breakbeats and funky electro. 
The speed in which this change in approach takes is remarkable and gives the idea of Vibert using the confidence gained by the success of the album to feel comfortable in really stretching out and developing his own sound. By the time the Adatmos EP came out in September, the drum machines had been retired in favour of funky drum loops, and although Inside and Yeah retain some of the atmospheric synth elements of his debut, it's clear that the Fat Lab Nightmare era is very much over. Despite being largely a curio of an artist debuting with an album in a style he's not at all known for, I really like Fat Lab Nightmare on its own strengths. If anything, the last two tracks feel like they should have been included on the Sunset Boulevard EP, maybe in place of Sleeper, which would work better here, and they slightly distract from the style on display. It might be a sound Vibert never returned to, but he did an incredible job adjusting to what he felt were label expectations at the time, and it's a great example of a fantastically inventive artist pushing himself and coming up with the goods. The New London School of Electronics, I'm not sure if I like the terrible pun or loathe it, was a one-off collaboration between Rising High head honcho Casper Pound and Lawrence Elliott Potter, not a household name but a man of many aliases and some renown, having collaborated with the likes of Dave Seaman and Paul Oakenfold. Potter had worked with Pound on many of the latter's own remixes and the two clearly had a close working relationship. Rising High's ambient output was admirably varied and what we have here is different once again to everything else released so far in 94. Opening with a brief two minute burst of electronic sound that feels like a deliberate homage to Tangerine Dream's Phaedra, we then head into the more tribal oriented sounds of The Queen and the Eclipse, before taking a dive into down tempo ambient techno with the stunningly beautiful Georgia. It's a fairly stripped back piece closer to the DIY sound of many silent records releases, if better engineered, but the melodies sell it completely. This sets up the feel of the rest of the album with occasional samples and abstract synth moments linking gentle minimal ambient techno. Nothing's quite as strong as Georgia, and occasionally it rambles. Mr. Sorphine is aimless, while Off is basically a techno track stripped of a regular kick. The title track is a remarkably intense Berlin school piece that acts as a great climax to the record before descending into a brief atmospheric outro. The deepest cut is never going to end up on a list of the all-time great ambient records, but that doesn't mean what's here isn't good. It's a less remembered record, but really worth checking out. If you showed me a 1994 album called Electronic Dub and asked me who was behind it, I wouldn't guess the new London School of Electronics and Air Liquide. After all, nothing they produced by this point really counted as dub. I suppose it was all electronic. Electronic Dub isn't an entirely misleading name, but it's not what I'd call it, especially to naming the album and every track Electronic Dub. The first part has a slower tempo and some deep bass, but then we head into fairly trebly ambient techno for part two, and all traces of dub are lost. The light bleeping melodies and crisp production of this section feel like Pound and Elliot, while the overall creepy darkness is pure air liquid. Indeed, this is much the case for the bulk of the album. If I were to guess the working process here, it feels like air liquid started up with their usual ambient techno paranoia, which was then fine tuned by the two Brits. Could be way off, of course, but gives an idea of the record's sound. Part 5 is the most overtly dubby, but the bass barely booms, instead focusing on squelchy acid. For those after a cold, minimal, almost proto-dub techno kind of record, then Electronic Dub has a lot to offer. Falls slightly outside my own taste, however. My favourite Rising High release of 94 is Syzygy's Morphic Resonance. There's that title again. In a nice link to one of the other video series I'm doing on YouTube, one half of Syzygy was Dominic Glover, one-time Doctor Who soundtrack composer. Although just about everything else the pair released was techno and trance, a couple of mellower b-sides aside, this album is top draw 90s ambient, the kind you'd expect two or three albums into a creative career in the style. The one thing early acts like the KLF and the Orb set up was the idea of music taking you on a constantly changing journey, and that's one thing many of the more minimal and repetitive records of the era lack. Morphic Resonance, however, is the kind of dense, detailed musical journey that's an absolute joy to get lost in. Open a life field switches between sections of deep synth bass and flute melodies into subtle percussion loops and then suddenly into a gorgeous piano melody. Layers of synth, percussion and samples come and go throughout, the piece's structure ever changing and developing. This opening track alone is enough for the album to deserve a place alongside high walked marks of the style like Lifeforms and 7614. It's also an enjoyably varied album without ever seeming disjointed. The filtered flutes and drones of Spirit fade into harps and field recordings which blend seamlessly – oh yes, I love a good gapless album – into the tribal drums and gated synths of Dreams of Flying, while the title track launches headfirst into epic ambient techno, 11 minutes of subtle beats, multiple synth sequences and eastern vocal samples. 
Moonworks is an abstract interlude, rumbling synths and strange disembodied sounds, and it pairs well with the playful arpeggios and spoken loops of dialogue of consciousness. All 11 tracks on Morphic Resonance are superb in their own right, but they combine to create an incredible journey. When I was first searching through the era to find more classics, I'd come across so many very good albums that were just missing that special something, that bit of magic that elevated them above two ravers with a drum machine and a sampler making some tunes to chill out to, and I was blown away when I finally got to this album. A truly unsung masterpiece of the era and one that deserves to be remembered as an all-time classic. Are you tired of the blue and black covers yet, by the way? Bad news, here comes another. Dominic Woozy's Neutron 9000 project had been around for a few years by this point, creating the down-tempo electro of the Greenhouse Effect, followed by the vocal house of the bafflingly titled Walrus. Having started exploring ambient music under his own name, as well as as Mysteries of Science, Woozy revived Neutron 9000 for Lady Burning Sky. Working this time with Lawrence Elliott Potter, initially brought in as an engineer and label representative and quickly developing into Woozy's creative partner, it's not a record like previous Neutron 9000 albums, nor is it like Woozy's other ambient records. And I'm going to put it out there straight away, the title track is one of the greatest pieces of music ever recorded. I make my own music, and every now and then I actually stumble my way into making a track that gives me goosebumps, the sort I listen to and think, no fucking way did I make something that good. In the past 25 years I've probably made enough to compile into a mini-album. But if I could make a track even a thousandth as good as Lady Burning Sky, I consider myself satisfied to stop forever. In the liner notes for the 2021 vinyl reissue of the album, Woozy says that after the album was completed, he didn't listen to it again until putting together the reissue 26 years later. How the hell do you make a piece of music this astonishingly beautiful and then not listen to it for more than a quarter of a century? It's one of those deceptive pieces that uses comparatively few elements. The bulk of it is taken up by five or six tracks of audio with bits and bobs laid on top, yet feels as detailed and fleshed out as you could ever hope a track to be. Dear musicians, never put the best track on the album first. If you can bear to do so, put it last. Alright, some of my own albums have ended up so rear-loaded that I'm sure a lot of people have given up before they've got to the first good track, but still, nothing on Lady Burning Sky could compare to those first 14 minutes. The album's only sub 10 minute track, Nab, is actually very strong and reasonably simplistic but perfectly balanced piece of 90s ambient, the booming kicks adding that perfect touch that grounds the track in the post-rave era. She Trails Flowers is warm, welcoming, friendly, a nice respite after two more dramatic pieces. Empire reverts quickly back to the dark, dramatic, emotive, melodic feel of the earlier tracks, slowly building up to a devastating climax. Suddenly exploding into Chunky Beats and 303 Acid, Indian Prayer ends the album with a bang. It's somewhat unexpected, but strong enough to get away with it. Oh right, yeah, there's also Talking Eyebrow. 18 minutes of frequently atonal synth noise, random bits of percussion and pretentious talking. Never before has a track come so close to ruining an album for me. Not only do I really dislike this track, and I'm a fan of odd abstract sound colleges, I just think this is badly done, but it's also so ill-fitting among the wide-eyed wonder that fills the rest of Lady Burning Sky that its entire existence feels like a personal insult. I sometimes lament the obsession over vinyl, especially given that so many ambient records are made to create a seamless atmospheric voyage, but the 3 LP reissue of this album does at least make it easy to pretend that side D doesn't exist. Still, that track aside, it's another huge hit. After two fantastic records in a row, surely rising high had a trip up somewhere. Oh right, no, it's a new Irresistible Force album. After the veritable classic of Flying High, Mixmaster Morris disappeared for a couple of years. Okay, he was keeping busy DJing and had of course released the first Dreamfish album with Pete Namluk. But there was no stopgap release, no single or EP. Anyway, after a period of silence, he returned to Rising High with the second Irresistible Force album, Global Chillage. It's a pun on Global Village and Chill Out, and honestly, Chillage is an awful word, with all apologies to Mick Chillage, but honestly, that name is bad. Thankfully, the music's not. Fundamentally, Global Chillage features the same aesthetic ideas as Flying High. The sounds here are all gated, arpeggiated, sent through quick delays, or a combination of those, leading to the same staccato sounds as the debut album. What's changed is the actual sounds themselves. The entire sound palette here is incredibly deeper than on the first record. Instead of being a synth, a couple of samples and a drum machine all lined up like soldiers, here the sounds come thick and fast and are less easily identified. 
Sonically, Downstream could have been put together by FSOL at their most mind-bending or the orb during the August Terrara obsessions. Sunstroke starts out like an earlier era track but swerves into a menacing metallic bassline and clattering drums. Snowstorm is ambient dub squeezed through the tightest of audio gates. This finally breaks through its constraints on waveform, which heads fully into dub territory. Eno's description of ambient as music that never changes, but never stops changing, is thrown through a vocoder for the brief manifesto of the last track. I have a lot of time for Morris. Back when I used Facebook for more than just moderating an FSOL group, I was friends with him on there. He often commented on my posts in a very chatty and friendly way, despite the fact that we didn't know each other. He's the same with others and just shows himself to be an incredibly easygoing, friendly and all-round decent human being. And in case it seems all a little bit too peace and love, I was delighted to find that the run out for side D of the Rising High Vinyl Edition features the etching, Keep It Underground, Fuck The Tories, a message for the ages. As for which album I prefer, well, Flying High is an ambient house landmark, and that euphoric pastoral ambient house vibe zoning out in an English meadow on a summer's day is so ingrained in it that it's hard not to love. The scrappier DIY sound is intrinsic in its charm, and I love it for that. But as a musical production, Global Chillage is just a big step up. It's ultimately the same idea, there are no major conceptual or compositional upgrades here, but the way everything is just given a thousand times more depth is astonishing. It's like wearing glasses after years of short-sightedness. We must be done by now, surely, I hear you ask. I know you loaded up this video six hours ago and we've lost the will to live since. We're near the end though, honest. Tanz Music's Shin Sakai is unusual in being recorded by two Japanese musicians. While by 94 this kind of music had reached around the world, there weren't many Japanese acts involved, especially releasing albums in the UK. At the end of 94, Rising High were beginning to take on a few more IDM leading acts, and Tanz Music were one. Okay, Asia Indian is trancey, but the bulk of the material here is in the 94 IDM style. Very slightly lo-fi, clanging beats with the rigid hardness to them, dark and minor key melodies. The chord sequences delve further than most in the genre, showing some strong compositional chops, but as an album it feels surprisingly generic after a run of memorably strong records on the label. Partially named after nomadic tribes living in the Middle East and Northern Africa, I always imagined Bedouin Ascent would fall either into the ethno or tribal ambient categories. It was with some surprise then that I discovered that the music's IDM, rooted in industrial influences. King's Up Bitswaz was one of the very few people of ethnic minorities working in the 90s ambient scene, and that may well have inspired the name. As for the music, debut album Science, Art and Ritual concludes Rising High's 94 run with more IDM. There are wonderful mellow beats and beautiful melodies in He Is She, while Ancient Ocean 2 does make more steps into ethnic territory with acoustic percussion elements and flute melodies. The 23 minute closer Beyond the Seventh Gate meanwhile is minimal ambience with stripped back beats. All three are very worth a listen for those in search of more ambient material, but the remaining tracks are very much in the punchy, poundy IDM vein. The remaining story of Rising High's 1994 comes in the form of compilations. The first release was the second volume of the Pete Namlu Definitive Ambient Collection series, a second collection of pieces largely drawn from the beatless tracks found on Fax Trance 12 inches, with a few tracks from previously licensed album by Silence Air and Dreamfish thrown in for good measure. Very soon Namloop will set up his ambient world label and no longer need to license fax material out to other labels, although ironically this album would end up being reissued on Ambient World itself, and has even ended up on Silent State's Pete Namloop Bandcamp page. The other two notable compilations are Chill Out or Die Volumes 2 or 3. After one of the UK's first and most memorable ambient techno compilations with the first wide-ranging Chill Out or Die, Rising High went all out with a vast 2 CD or 4 LP set at the start of 94, featuring many of their own artists plus several licenses from other labels. With its longer runtime and more developed sound, the second is probably the most easily recommendable of the series. 94 closed with the release of Volume 3, but by this point things had cut back to a single CD or double LP again, with every track coming from the Rising High catalogue. It was like a strange decrease in confidence, especially as most of these tracks were released on the label's albums not long before the compilation came out. Still, it's fair to say that 94 was a triumph for Rising High, a label which had mostly dealt in dance singles in the past. For those who've delved further than the biggest names in 90s ambient, Rising High is one of the key labels of the era, with several absolute classics released in 94. And with that, I'm going to lie down. 
please do let me know your thoughts on these wonderful albums and Rising Highs catalogue and as a label in general I'd love to hear them and there are subscribe like and share buttons you might also like to press and for those of you who use Spotify check down below in the video description there should be a link to a Spotify playlist that accompanies this series of videos I'll be updating that with all the material I cover every time a video comes out I'll be back next time with another range of British labels I hope to see you then